Mm -hmm. Did I miss any spot shaving? <laughs> okay, I think we're going to get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Pena, Marketing Specialist at Verity IT. Today's webinar will be covering limitations of cybersecurity and backup that, and why it's crucial for backup to evolve. Today, we're joined by James Slaby to discuss the impact of cybersecurity and backup further. James is the Director of Cyber Protection at Acromis. He's also worked as an industry analyst covering cybersecurity, cloud services, and networking at research firms like Forrester and Yankee Group. With over 300 published tech research reports, he has been quoted in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, and hundreds of tech publications. Thanks for joining us, James. Thanks so much, Liz. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking uh, half an hour out of your very busy schedules uh, to join us for this. Uh, let me take you quickly through today's agenda. I'm going to start off by setting the table with some cybersecurity statistics and trends. This is a big uh, part of my uh, role as Cyber Protection Director at Acronis. It's effectively a product role, and uh, I try to support uh, various aspects of the organization with uh, research into what's going on with cybersecurity. I don't think you're gonna find a lot of surprises in the data that I'm gonna show you, but I think it's always useful to give you some stats so that uh, if later on uh, you've gotta make a case uh, for upgrading your cybersecurity capabilities or moving to the kind of data protection cybersecurity combination I'm gonna be talking about later on, you've got some evidence to back you up, something you can uh, take to your leadership and say, look, this is real. This is not just me saying we've got an issue here. This is going on everywhere and we have to deal with it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how kind of classic traditional data protection in the form of uh, old school backup really isn't uh, up to managing the kind of cybersecurity threat environment that we face nowadays. You know, if you're really worried about what downtime uh, can do to your business, how can it adversely affect your customers, your brand, your relationships uh, in business, then you've got to get a little bit more conscientious about protecting against downtime, both from the kind of traditional ways that we associate with it, you know, your hardware fails, uh, a tech makes a configuration error, you get hit by a power outage, you know, think of poor Texas uh, with their unseasonable winter snap and how that uh, brought so many businesses down, but also the cybersecurity threat environment. As we'll see over the past year, we've really um, uh, faced a kind of a welter of new threats that we didn't have to deal with so much before. So yeah, we're basically advocating for a more holistic approach, combining cybersecurity and backup into a new discipline that we call cyber protection. We'll then take some questions uh, from the audience, wrap it up. I'm going to try to get through this whole thing, including a q a in just half an hour so that you can get back on with your day all right let's look at um, a few cybersecurity to statistics and trends you know <clears throat> if you read the tech press and the business press large enterprises get all the headlines uh, when there's a, an attack like the solar winds software supply chain attack or the recent uh, mess that's uh, happened with Microsoft Exchange servers, that, that terrible, uh, terrible breach there. It's big companies that kind of grab the news. But the fact is that uh, cyber criminals these days are equal opportunity attackers and are going after small and medium businesses, mid-market companies as well. And that's because they're relatively easy targets, right? Uh, we don't have the skills, we don't have the resources, we don't have the manpower uh, to fend off uh, these kind of new threats. So they're really going after the, the broad spectrum of company sizes. FBI reported nearly, I say 300% increase uh, in attacks in the first few months of the pandemic, but it was really closer to 400%. So if you thought the cyber criminals would take time off just because they were stuck at home, no, they doubled down their efforts and uh, made life uh, miserable for all of us taking advantage of uh, the new uh, surge in remote work or move to cloud services, et cetera. Uh, as I said, small, medium businesses really feeling the brunt of it. Two thirds of us uh, have gotten hit that way. Most of us don't have a good 
incident response plan ready if we do get hit. Uh, and in general, we spend more time dealing with the tools that we have, trying to keep a handle on everything that's going on, trying to keep our systems up to date, uh, rather than actually uh, fighting the threats. Uh, I alluded to this uh, a moment ago when I talked about how uh, data is much more vulnerable in the wake of the pandemic and the fact that everyone suddenly found themselves working from home. But this is just a continuation of a trend that's been going on for a while now, which is that we are increasingly moving data out of centralized data center or data closet, server closet type locations out into the cloud, out into uh, remote facilities, uh, out closer to uh, IoT sensors, if, uh, if that's part of your business. So uh, for the typical small business, you've probably got more data in the cloud where uh, if you're not careful, it uh, is not as well protected as it when it was when you were licensing software and managing it uh, on a server in your own premises. Um, if you're say a healthcare organization, you might have a lot more uh, urgent care healthcare facilities where you're keeping data locally there. It's not all in some uh, uh, centralized data center anymore. So uh, that data out there uh, becomes easy pickings. It's, it's hard to keep a handle on. Many of us don't have a ton of experience managing, protecting cloud-based data. We saw a lot of attacks that happened uh, in the past year because people moved to SaaS applications kind of ahead of schedule. They were sort of forced to. Uh, they couldn't man their own data centers anymore. It's like, well, we were planning on doing this in 21, 2021 or 2022, but no, we got to do, we got to move now. And uh, that inexperienced techs would make configuration errors, leave cloud data stores exposed, a lot of breaches, a lot of data theft, uh, ransomware attacks and so forth. Um, and this is a trend that we can only expect to uh, continue to keep going. I, I think we're rapidly approaching an age where when new companies start up, they don't have any premise-based software at all, that they're, they're really kind of cloud-centric in, in their application environment. So figuring out how to uh, protect your critical business data, your applications in this uh, sort of more distributed environment is going to continue to be a, a challenge going forward. I spent a lot of time um, uh, doing public speaking on the subject of ransomware. That's because it's the just the biggest, scariest, ugliest, most pervasive malware threat that we've seen. And it's been that kind of uh, number one with a bullet for the last three years. And the reason for it is, A, it's super profitable. You know, why do you rob banks, Mr. Dillinger? That's, that's where the money is. Ransomware uh, is, uh, is a great way to uh, extract money. You don't actually have to necessarily steal any data. Uh, you just got to hold customer's data hostage wherever it resides and get your money that way. Uh, the production methods have also gotten much more sophisticated. Cyber criminals uh, now develop ransom uh, uh, malware the way legitimate SaaS companies develop their products. So, the, so think of salesforce.com only nefarious and you get an idea of how uh, industrialized in scale, how iterative uh, uh, their process is and how much more sophisticated they've gotten in terms of software distribution as well. Um, uh, uh, they, uh, any, any typical rans ransomware gang now has an army of distributors around the world. All you really need is a laptop and internet connection and this like Java app, uh, applet that you can get on the dark web for as little as zero dollars and you can get into the distribution business, start crafting phishing emails, trying to get that a product, if you will, on as many machines as possible. And every time you close a deal, in other words, a successful ransomware attack is triggered, uh, you get a cut uh, of it. It's exactly like uh, the way Salesforce compensates its uh, army of global distributors. So that scale, they can really get it on a ton of machines. And their sort of industrial production methods means that they're iterating multiple instantiations of a particular ransomware variant every single day. So your classic signature-based antivirus can't possibly keep up with it. Pretty much every ransomware attack these days looks like a zero day. So that's uh, <clears throat> there's a reason that uh, you keep reading about ransomware attacks. And of course, now the criminals in the past year have come up with very effective 
ways to ratchet up the pressure on you to get you to pay. So now we're increasingly seeing the so-called double extortion attack where they actually exfiltrate data first, they steal a bunch of sensitive data, then they trigger the encryption attack. And then when you get the ransom note, it says, uh, you, if you ever wanna get your data unlocked, uh, you need the decryption key, you gotta pay us. Oh, by the way, if you don't pay us, we're gonna start leaking your sensitive data online. And that's potentially embarrassing. You might lose, they, they might be leaking your business plans or marketing plans, uh, sensitive intellectual property. It's, it's a very serious threat. If nothing else, you could, they could leak a lot of embarrassing emails. Um, you know, you think about how, uh, the damage that Sony hit just from uh, having a trove of uh, emails released. Another uh, tactic that we're seeing to ratchet up the pressure now is distributed denial of service tax. You know, pay up quickly on this ransom. We'll give you the decryption key. We won't bring down all your servers with uh, a flood of uh, spurious traffic, uh, the, the classic DDoS attack. Uh, and uh, the numbers that we see and that we see from uh, other security research organizations is that this is just trending steadily upward and uh, there's no relief in sight soon. If you're trying to convince uh, your management that this is a real threat, the news helps you because there's a major attack that hits the headlines of you know, even the business press. You don't even have to look at the tech press uh, to read about these. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the big companies get uh, a lot of the noise uh, and the attention from the press because you know the ransoms now that the large enterprises are facing are often tens of millions of dollars. And the ultimate damage by the time they pay the ransom, clean up, recover their data, uh, uh, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And that often includes things like a hit on their stock price or uh, customers that don't renew contracts with them because they can feel like this company can't protect our data. Uh, but even smaller organizations are, are getting hit pretty hard. Uh, I, I, I point to the, um, the University of California example here down from uh, January where the bad guys locked up uh, $100 million worth of uh, basic research data this is the med school you know these these folks are doing cancer research and that kind of thing a lot a lot of um grant money um uh, invested in that and very valuable ip so uh, paying a million dollar ransom seemed like a pretty good deal for them but even so for a school like that that's got to be just a crushing hit uh, to their bed, uh, budget uh, the point is that uh, you're going to continue to uh, be able to point to these kind of high profile attacks uh, for the foreseeable future Another big problem uh, for uh, uh, small, medium businesses is that nobody just has the money. Um, survey data that we have here, um, it shows that <laughs> nearly uh, two companies in five have less than $1,000 a year to spend on IT security. And if that sounds pitiful, I, I think it really is. I, I can't imagine trying to uh, protect uh, a small business the data of you know a dozen or a couple dozen employees uh, with that little money and those numbers don't appear to be going up anytime soon uh, indications that you might get three four percent uh, increase in your budget on average that's still really inadequate uh, given the sophistication and the, the, the sheer volume of the threats we face i've got a, a buddy uh, who uh, runs our cyber protection uh, research operations uh, out of Switzerland, where we're headquartered, and his labs count 600,000 new variations of malware every day. A thousand bucks a year really kind of seems pitiful uh, with uh, uh, just the sheer scope and the scale of the uh, attack environment that we're all facing. All right, so how, how do you respond? Uh, I'll, I'll talk kind of briefly about uh, the way we kind of view the approach to that problem. Um, but for starters, you've got to look at your legacy cybersecurity tools, your legacy backup tools, and recognize that they have some significant limitations in the current environment. I'm going to talk about backup in detail for a moment. Um, but the classic one uh, from a malware perspective is that many of us are still relying on signature-based AV. And when every day is a zero a day attack, a signature based AV checking against a known uh, marker, um, a fingerprint, if you will, isn't gonna help because your SIG file is gonna be out of date every, every morning when you wake up. 
Uh, there's also new techniques uh, that are uh, com uh, completely evade SIG-based AV. Things like what if you've heard of a living off the land attack or um, a direct memory injection attack, that's when the bad guys uh, compromise a tool, um, a remote desktop management tool, for instance, uh, PowerShell, for instance, and load malware directly into memory. It never resides on disk, never gets a chance to be scanned uh, prior to it, it, uh, its execution. So it's another way to completely end run uh, some of your existing legacy tools. Stat I often quote is that the average time it takes to patch a known vulnerability is 102 days. So uh, even when it comes to known threats, I'm not even talking about zero days, stuff that Microsoft or your application vendors or your networking hardware vendors have acknowledged, look, we found this bug. This is a vulnerability. Here's a patch for it. Install it as soon as you can. And on average, it takes us over three months to get around patching that. It's just very hard to keep up. In some cases, uh, you don't want to deploy a patch without testing it against your production applications in a alpha environment first to make sure that the patch doesn't break any functionality or uh, 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 cause performance issues, those kind of things. So there's reasons. It's not just that we can't keep up. Sometimes we have good reasons to kind of slow roll that patching process to make sure it's not affecting the, the software that runs the business. Um, but that is three months at a time on average that bad guys have to take advantage of these known open uh, uh, vulnerabilities that they can exploit with malware and, uh, uh, and other techniques. Um, I talk about um, the need to kind of learn why and how you're being targeted. I think the why is pretty simple. Um, everyone's got uh, valuable data to protect. Many of us uh, are subject to compliance regulations, you know, privacy regulations. So for instance, the EU has had GDPR for a couple of years now, but those kind of privacy regulations are coming to the US as well. California has had the CCPR out for a couple of years. Uh, Virginia of, is just activating some new privacy legislation and there are state level privacy initiatives uh, all over the country. And with a new administration, the possibility of a kind of a national privacy initiative seems more likely. So getting caught for uh, compliance violations because you didn't protect your customer's data, ransomware attacks, uh, stole it and leaked it, for instance, um, is, is another issue. So why it's super profitable, uh, why you need to worry about it is you don't want to pay uh, ransoms, you don't want to lose sensitive customer data, you don't want to be in violation of any kind of regulatory uh, regimen that you're subject to. Uh, how you're being targeted, uh, I've talked about it again and again. Um, clearly, the number one entry point is still phishing. So employees clicking on email attachments or links in emails, they shouldn't still is the most reliable way to get uh, malware uh, inside your defenses. Um, but there are a variety of other techniques, and the bad guys are coming up with new ones all the time. You know, the, the involvement of nation state actors is particularly troubling. Uh, when you see um, China and Russia and Iran and North Korea uh, all uh, pitching in to help their criminal element uh, to attack uh, Western businesses, Western government institutions. So that SolarWinds software supply chain breach was kind of heavily targeted at both private enterprise and government institutions. And by attacking a very popular software vendor that had uh, uh, access into tens of thousands of companies with its network management product, uh, you compromise that, then you can compromise their customers and lots of people had sensitive data stolen. And that could have been much, much worse. The, the malware that they deployed was basically for espionage purposes, but it could have just as easily have been ransomware and the havoc that they could have wreaked there uh, is really scary to contemplate. The Microsoft breach of Exchange servers is another really troubling one, and that's still a developing story. We, we don't know everything about the SolarWinds attack yet. There's more issues to drop there, but we're really in the early days of this uh, Exchange uh, server attack. And it looks like tens of thousands of companies have potentially had a backdoor installed in their system. So you can install the patches from Microsoft. There still might be a threat hiding um, in your network. Uh, with who knows what damage uh, 
yet to go. So uh, it's not just the classic sort of phishing attacks. There's all kinds of uh, insidious new techniques that the bad guys, as many of them with the help of uh, their country's uh, national intelligence, you know, NSA equivalents, uh, are coming up with new ways to get inside and get at your data all the time. So the bottom line means that you've got some adjustments to make going forward, even if you have pitiful budgets, um, uh, you really have to think about how you're going to deal with this kind of new threat environment. Uh, the vulnerabilities that are exposed by the fact that um, a bunch of us have moved to remote work environments, you know, the end of the pandemic may be in sight, but it looks like a lot of us are still going to be uh, working from home. I know I expect to be not uh, back to the office five days a week. Uh, so Acronis has to uh, figure out, uh, you make sure that my home environment is protected. And the world is increasingly moving to SaaS. And that means data that's out in the cloud. You can't really rely on uh, uh, Microsoft or Google or Amazon uh, to fully protect your data. You know, we saw this um, OVH uh, cloud, which is Europe's biggest uh, cloud infrastructure services provider. They compete with Amazon and Microsoft and Google there. And they're one of the biggest in the world via, uh, below those uh, big three. They had a massive fire in their, um, their data centers in uh, Western France, and it brought down uh, servers and uh, applications and caused data loss all over the country. And so they were advising their customers in the wake of the fire, you know, if you've got a disaster recovery plan, trigger it. But I imagine, you know, 90 plus percent of their customers had no disaster recovery plan in place. That means that you have to think about uh, protecting your, you know, your uh, Microsoft 365 data, your, uh, your Google Apps data, because your infrastructure providers, the people that you're, you're getting, you know, renting server space from in the cloud are, are really doing a very nominal, uh, minimal job of, uh, of uh, protecting that data. It's really something uh, that's worth scrutinizing. I think a lot of people labor under the impression that Microsoft is going to protect and restore your data for you, and they really put limits on uh, how much they do with that unless you're paying a, a premium and most people aren't. Um, I like to talk about how uh, the bad guys are uh, very sophisticated in their application of the, the latest technology out there. So they're using artificial intelligence machine learning. They're getting much cleverer about uh, integrating and coordinating uh, multiple tools uh, in the process of uh, conducting these sophisticated uh, long time frame kind of attacks and uh, they're using automation uh, to ramp up the volume and the number of uh, iterations of attacks that they generate so if you're not responding in kind if you're not taking advantage of ai and ml if you're not using more automated tools if you're not finding a way to more tightly integrate the tools that you're bringing to bear for your defense you're not going to keep up with these threats uh, as long as phishing uh, remains popular and boy, it's a perennial that succeeds again and again, you're going to have to keep focusing on keeping your colleagues and your partners uh, cyber aware, you know, keep reminding them that they have to be suspicious about emails from sources that they absolutely uh, aren't 100% uh, trusting in. Uh, and that kind of security awareness training can really, uh, really pay dividends. So I encourage you to find ways to keep reminding everybody in your organization from the executives on down uh, to you know, be aware that uh, there are vultures everywhere. Uh, last thing I wanna talk about is backup. And this is really kind of, uh, if there's a point I want to, you to take away with here, it's how I really strongly believe that your backup has to start moving in the direction of cybersecurity, uh, kind of meeting it halfway and playing uh, in a much more coordinated, integrated, automated fashion with it. Um, so I really believe that uh, the kind of classic legacy backup and legacy cybersecurity uh, offer the worst of both worlds, uh, given the current threat environment and the shifts in our own um, network and data topologies these days. So your classic uh, signature-based antivirus is not protecting your data uh, the way it used to. It can't deal with those zero-day threats. There is no 
um, inherent data recovery capabilities in those tools. Um, they, um, they're useless against some of these modern attack techniques. Um, there's that, please don't confuse LOL with the, um, as anything funny, this is the living off the land, the direct memory injection attack um, that I talked about earlier that kind of completely end runs um, AV. And if you're dealing, for instance, with things like vulnerability scanning and patch management and URL filtering and um, it, it, it advanced uh, endpoint uh, uh, data protection capabilities and data loss prevention capabilities, you've got this proliferation of tools and agents that really adds complexity that is kind of uh, counterproductive to what you're trying to do. Uh, traditional backup, again, uh, not secure, uh, not um, great against defending itself against attacks. Um, if a uh, ransomware attack, for instance, infects your backup uh, you, and it's not protected, uh, then you're, you can't restore your backup. Um, malware is capable of getting into backups. If you got an infected backup and you restore it, then your uh, target uh, machine uh, now has the malware as well. Uh, and plus, typical backup doesn't capture any forensics data either. It's not uh, giving you anything useful that you can use in the wake of an attack to figure out what went wrong. And again, that combination of tools there uh, adds complexity and cost and uh, makes it more likely that something is going to slip through the cracks. You have multiple agents on endpoints. They're all occupying memory, uh, taking up production cycles. Sometimes they conflict with one another. You know, my AV agent looks at my uh, URL filtering agent and thinks, is, is that, do, uh, you know, you get um, um, basically false positives against each other. Uh, then you've got the complexity of licensing to deal with, uh, and maybe dealing with a bunch of different vendors. And you've got multiple consoles on the back end. You, your people have to learn a new interface every time. Uh, they're swiveling in their chair. Uh, uh, there's no correlation. Uh, between uh, various security events. Um, so kind of having a disparate tool set and uh, legacy tools there, we really don't believe uh, is gonna keep you up with modern threats. So this is uh, what we uh, kind of propose as the alternative is a combination of AI enabled um, cybersecurity uh, with tools to help you deal with your vulnerability scanning, your patch management, uh, a bunch of other kind of uh, critical uh, endpoint protection capabilities integrated with uh, backup and recovery uh, where uh, you've got the ability to um, scan backups for malware and actually apply patches before you do a recovery. So you never have to worry about uh, recovering from um, a bad backup or an infected backup. And then remote management tools uh, that you can use to protect users against uh, malicious websites, catch up on your um, your uh, scanning, your vulnerability scanning and patch management uh, treadmill, you know, reduce that 102 days down to a much narrower window where you've got open exploits. Uh, and then other tools that you need to uh, manage users and uh, in this increasingly distributed environment that we live in. And basically bring your costs down to deal with the fact that, you know, you're your budget's not gonna go up in a huge way. So it's time to start applying some automation to it, some artificial intelligence and some integration so that you can basically uh, inc increase the throw weight of your techs. Uh, you need a force multiplier uh, for the tools that you've got, make the most of those tiny budgets work and uh, basically confront those new threats. All right, I'm not going to spend um, a, a ton of time uh, here because uh, we're already running up against um, half an hour here. Uh, but certainly, um, Verity will be uh, happy uh, to help you get some more details of uh, specific features here. I don't want to make this uh, too much of a product pitch here. Um, I'm more interested in getting uh, the conceptual framework across to you here. Um, but understand that uh, the, the gist of this is having one tool set, single agent on every endpoint and a single console is going to yield some obvious benefits, both in terms of your operational cost, your training and so forth. Um, but that integration and particularly the use of AI um, 
that can detect threats based on their behavior as opposed to what they look like and help you deal with zero day threats, particularly ransomware is kind of just a great way of triaging your problem, focusing on the kind of the biggest threats and closing the biggest gaps that you have uh, in your existing tool sets. Again, uh, this is just a kind of a conceptual uh, a schematic of our particular approach. Um, I, I think we, we can move on from this, uh, but again, we're, we're happy to give you more details of, uh, of the Acronis approach, uh, what's under the hood of our solutions, uh, if you're interested in that. Also have some resources I wanna point you to. Uh, the Acronis Resource Center has tons of case studies, um, I particularly like this third party uh, product testing results thing because, um, you know, not everyone thinks of Acronis in uh, the cyber side of cyber protection, uh, but there's tons of independent labs that have tested us against uh, the better known names in the field and show how really awesome our like anti ransomware capabilities are. So well, you don't have to take our word for it. There's a lot of uh, independent uh, testing and research out there that uh, shows what a good job we're doing there. And with that, I'd um, uh, like to open the floor to uh, some Q&A and um, hand the baton back to Liz here. Yeah, thank you so much, James. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we did have a few questions roll in, if you wouldn't mind addressing those, James. Sure. Um, the first one we had is, is it more beneficial to have a cloud backup or a physical backup? So a great question. Um, you know, the, one of the first things I learned when I joined Acronis seven years ago now, wow, time flies, um, is the uh, three, two, one rule of backup. This is a principle that we hammer again and again. And that is basically saying you want diversity of backup. You want diversity of locations. You want diversity of physical media. So ideally you've got um, three copies minimum at any time, your production data, uh, a backup that, that is local to you, and then a backup that is offsite. And nowadays uh, offsite usually means the cloud, doesn't have to be, um, but that uh, gives you a, a, a lot of resiliency that you wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, you know, for example, um, a lot of ransomware uh, these days has worm capabilities in it. So if it compromises one machine, you know, I'm not paying attention. I click on an attachment. I shouldn't, my machine gets infected. It starts looking over my local area network for other machines that it can jump to and also infect. And it's particularly interested in local backup servers, because if I encrypt your backup, uh, then you're going to have a much harder time of trying to restore and not paying me the ransom. So, um, uh, that's where cloud backups are, are particularly helpful. Uh, most of these worm capabilities aren't capable of, uh, of jumping to the cloud that they can only work uh, within your own organization. So the answer is, uh, is both. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I'd also argue that uh, depending on um, the, the scope of your business and how critical uptime is to you, that you ought to consider disaster recovery as a service as well. There's a ton of great uh, technology out there these days that will allow you to, uh, if a, a primary location goes down, you can throw to replicated servers in the cloud, uh, flip a switch and get your staff uh, up and running again in a matter of minutes. Uh, that particularly looks attractive, I think, given how much more prone to natural disasters we are these days. It seems like a heating planet means more violent storms, uh, more flooding uh, and so forth. So a DR as a service is uh, something I would add as a kind of a fourth uh, component of that three, two, one rule. Okay, great. And then we'll do one more since we are tight on time. This one kind of goes hand in hand. How secure is online backup? Um, so uh, the answer there is, it's kind of as secure as you want to make it. You know, we basically advocate that uh, you take advantage of the encryption capabilities that we offer, which is encrypting your data in transit to its backup location and encrypting it um, in whatever cloud repository you're storing it in. That could be, you know, one of the big providers, you know, an Azure or a, 
uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, it could be another cloud provider. It could be a private cloud that you've put together. We give you all the different kind of options there that you want in terms of your backup targets. But the way that we do encryption is that you keep the keys where you, we never have um, access to your encryption keys. So you're the only one that can, can really um, unencrypt it. So that uh, is basically what we're, we're advocating there. We also have a capability uh, that's based on blockchain whereby you can effectively notarize your backups and your online data repositories. The way it works is uh, prior to uh, the backup being created, moved to that say, let's say cloud target, we take a cryptographic hash of, of the archive and start in the blockchain. And if you know about blockchain technology, once it's there, it can't be, it's immutable. The, everyone agrees that that data cannot be tampered with. That's how cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin work. Uh, everyone agrees that the numbers are what uh, we believe them to be. So that when you recover that data, you can take another cryptographic hash of that, uh, of that archive that you're trying to restore. And if it matches the one on the blockchain, then you can know down to the last bit that you're your data hasn't been messed with. So there's another, um, it's called um, Crotus um, Cyber Notary. And that, that's another way that you can um, basically ensure the integrity of uh, data and backups that you've stored in the cloud. Awesome, thank you so much, James. And that's all the time we do have for today. Um, if your question was not answered live, we'll shoot you an email with the answer as soon as possible. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. As thought leaders in the IT industry, we are hosting monthly webinars throughout the year surrounding cybersecurity. And we'd love if you join our next webinar, The Truth Beneath the Dark Web on April 28th. We will reach out with an invite and a list of our up other upcoming webinars as well. Thank you so much. And we hope everyone has a productive day.